Well, this evening our main study is concerning the healing of the epileptic boy, and we have this in all three. We have an account of this in all three of the synoptics, that's Matthew, Mark, and also Luke. And we'll read firstly in Mark, Mark chapter 17. Mark chapter 17, and reading at verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, they came to him, a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out to him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And the account we have of the same incident in Luke's Gospel is to be found in chapter 9. Chapter 9 and at verse 37. And it came to pass on the next day, when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him that he foameth again, and bruising him hardly departeth from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered everyone at all these things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not the saying, and it was hid from them, and they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. And this obviously is a prophecy concerning his approaching death. Well, Mark's account is to be found in chapter 9. Chapter 9 at verse 14. And Mark's account is, in fact, the most detailed we have of these, this incident. And despite Matthew and Luke's accounts being much shorter, there are some items in Mark's, Matthew's account and Luke's account as well that we don't have in Mark. For example, Matthew tells us that when the father approached the afflicted boy, he knelt before him and then said, And Jesus points out to the lack of sufficient faith being the cause of the disciples' failure to heal this boy. Luke tells us that it happened the day after the transfiguration, which we dealt with last week. And again from Luke, we learn that this child is the man's only child. And it's Luke that closes his account with the wonderful statement, they were all astonished, not at the miracles notice, but at the majesty of God. Some in the crowd had realized that this, as John would have said if he had given an account, John uses the word sign as a pointer. He describes the miracles of Jesus as signs pointing to the fact, proof positive, this is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. This is none other than the Son of God. 
And in Luke, as I say, we have some of the crowd were astonished at the majesty of God, ascribing the majesty of God to Jesus and to his actions. You can see that they're almost at the kingdom, as it were, you could say. So this incident is immediately follows a transfiguration in all three of the synoptic gospels. You know that we call Matthew, Mark, and Luke synoptic. Two Greek words. I don't apologize for giving you this Greek little lesson. Synoptic, two Greek words meaning one viewpoint. John is not included in that. He is different in many ways, complementary in many ways. And the writers, many commentators believe that the writers are seeking to make a comparison between this incident which happened on a hill and another incident which happened on a hill but in the Old Testament, namely when Moses is given the Ten Commandments. And when he comes down, disobedience, lack of faith is displayed where the people have risen up to dance and to play and they... Well, Aaron, isn't it, says that they simply threw the gold earrings into the furnace and out came an idol, as if it was, he's suggesting to say, a miraculous providence, where obviously it wasn't. That idol had to be formed, that idol had to be shaped. So we're presented here with the unbelieving and the bickering teachers, teachers of the law who should have known better, because they are teachers of the law, that is the Old Testament and we're also met with the powerless disciples who sadly show a lack of faith also. And on the other hand, in comparison with that, we have the wonderful, the amazement of the miracle which Jesus performs in curing the child, this epileptic boy. The opposition then of the teachers of the law is likened to the rebellion of the Israelites in Moses' time. But the disciples are sadly in danger of the same sort of spiritual darkness. So verse 14, and when he, that is Jesus, came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning them. Jesus and the three disciples, remember that's Peter, James and John, having descended from the Mount of Transfiguration, see a large crowd surrounding the other nine disciples, and they soon notice that there are scribes arguing with them. And these scribes, sadly, are filled with malicious glee at the inability of the nine disciples to cure the boy. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. So there's some in the crowd who are pleased to see the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some in the crowd who run to him and do him honor. They salute him. This sudden appearance was most welcome to the disciples, of course, and some of the crowd who expectantly and excitedly run to meet him. The scribes are not left far behind because no doubt they want to come and rub rub the failure of the disciples before int no the phrase I was going to use was very disrespectful they are going to be filled with glee saying to Jesus look your disciples are unable to help this man there are some commentators when it says they were great the people were greatly amazed some commentators wonder what they were amazed at and they try to suggest that the transfiguration brightness is still clinging to the Lord Jesus Christ. But none of the three synoptic gospel writers make any account of that. It's just they were greatly amazed, and they're trying to, on those few words, make out this possibility, but there's no evidence for it at all. And Jesus asks the scribes, what question ye with them? Jesus doesn't need to ask this question to be told of the situation. He knows all things. He's fully aware of the situation. He's sadly aware of the weakness and the failure of these nine disciples. And yet his love for them is still there. And he comes to their rescue. 
the fun that the scribes were having at the disciples' expense suddenly stops. And the law experts are not keen to answer Jesus' question. One of, the, one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, this is the father of the boy, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. The father of the afflicted child gives the history of the sufferings of his only child. And are we not reminded when we're told, as we have been in one of the other disciples, the other writers rather, the only son of this man, are we not reminded of the only son of the widow of Nain, the only daughter of Jairus? The heart of God's only son himself goes out to these only children and the parents of these only children. The father respectfully addresses Jesus as teacher. The man's original intention was to bring his grievously afflicted son to Jesus to be healed. But when he discovers Jesus is not there, he's on the Mount of Transfiguration, he turns to the help of the disciples and asks them to cure his son. And he's not asking them an impossible thing, because remember from Mark chapter 6 and also Matthew chapter 10, we know that when the disciples were sent out, they were commissioned to cast out demons, not only to preach the good news, but to cast out demons. Christ has given them the power to do this. So it's not something that was beyond their ability. But in this present case, because we know also from, again, Matthew 6 and this time Luke chapter 9, when the disciples come back with glee, they tell Jesus what they have done. They have preached the good news. They have cast out demons. But in this present case, well, there's a reason given, for us in verse, given to us in verse 29 why the disciples failed. And when we review the various symptoms that have been described for us by all three of the synoptics, we realize that this is much more than just a case of epilepsy. There is, this is not an ordinary case of epilepsy, and that must be stressed. There is definitely demonic possession here, the spirit that has caused the child to be a deaf mute. The spirit, the evil spirit that causes him to be thrown into the fire and causes him to throw himself into water also. Verse 19. And Jesus answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. By this exclamation, Jesus is expressing his pain and indignation. His complaint is directed towards the generation, showing that he's not, Jesus is not just thinking about the nine disciples who have failed in this emergency, but the faithlessness is amongst the people also. Jesus is dissatisfied with the Father who lacks sufficient faith in Christ's healing power. We see this in verses 22 and 24. Have compassion on her. But if thou canst do anything, if, addressing Jesus, saying, if thou canst do anything, there's, there's not complete faith here. There's not a full expectation that a cure shall be performed even by the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he's been faced with nine disciples unable to help. Will the master of these disciples be any better? And the scribes are showing no pity whatsoever, but they are gloating at the disciples' impotence. The disciples, well, there is a sadness surely in the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples, because of their failure to exercise their faith by putting their whole heart into persevering prayer, as we shall see again when we come to verse 29. 
And they brought him, the boy, unto Jesus. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. Evidence again, this is not epilepsy. This reaction, this symptom is brought about when the demon within the child sees the Lord Jesus Christ. The demon must know that his time is short. The time of possessing this child is coming to an end. So one last time he tries to destroy the child as it were. Straightway the spirit tears him. He falls to the ground. He wallows foaming. The conclusion stated earlier, this is not an ordinary case of epilepsy, but one brought about and aggravated by a demon is clear here. Verses 21 and 22. And Jesus asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, since he was a child. And oftentimes it's cast him into the fire, often into the waters to destroy him. But if there's that uncertainty but if thou canst do anything have compassion on us and help us jesus doesn't need this information he requests from the father as i've said already he knows all things he knows the situation the boy is in and the father's care for him but this questioning the father will cause the father to reflect on how long the son has undergone this and the cure is going to be instant and immediately when Jesus performs this miracle. From the father reply, do we not see a tender and an intense love for the boy? And do we not see time and time again when people bring folk to the Lord for cure? Those four friends who dismantled the roof and lowered the paralytic down before the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we not see here the reality, the proof positive that this, these are actual events that happened? The love and the concern time and time again, not only shown by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in the cure, but in the love and concern of these people bringing their friends to the Lord for help, for cure. The father loves his child and brings him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And can we contrast the if you can with the leper who speaks in Mark chapter 1, if you will, you can. There is more faith, it seems, in the expectation of the leper to be cured than the father. Or is the father thinking, This is so wonderful, if only it could be. Maybe I've been too cruel on the father in the situation that the man is in. The father thoroughly identifies himself with the son's situation. Take pity on us. Help us. He's as close in this care and concern with the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter, remember. We looked at that some weeks ago. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Jesus points out that the question is not whether he, Jesus, can cure the boy, it's rather whether the father believes that he can cure the boy. While it is not true that Jesus never healed anyone unless that person manifested genuine faith, it is true that he places great emphasis on that person's faith. Remember the centurion. I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. You don't need to come. I'm a man under authority myself. I say to somebody, go, and he goes. He just expects the Lord Jesus Christ to pronounce the cure, and it will be done. And the Lord commends his faith, that he hadn't found such faith, even in all Israel, as this Gentile, this Roman centurion, the faith that he had expressed, he had in the Lord Jesus Christ. Say it, Lord, and it will be. What lovely, simple faith 
great faith, really, the centurion had. Verse 24, straightway the father of the child cried out, and with tears. This is real people here. And with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. How many times have we taken those words and made them our prayers? Lord, we believe. But we recognize that at times our belief kind of slips and we almost, almost let go. Help thou our unbelief, Lord. The father's response is striking. He's certain of two things, that he has faith, the faith which Jesus demands, and that his faith is imperfect. This man, his testimony is ours also. We have faith. We have been given faith. We know from Ephesians that faith is the gift of God. But we know that our exercise of that faith is never perfect. The man makes profession of his faith. He petitions for that faith to be helped and strengthened. This is what we do also. We have faith, but our petition to God is, Help thou strengthen our faith, Lord. Verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit. Remember again with the feeding of the 5,000, the people wanted to make him king, and Jesus departed quickly. Jesus does not want these crowds to gather around him to hail him as a miracle worker, make him a king, thinking that with miracles he will rid them of the Roman oppressors. So quickly he rebukes the foul spirit, saying unto the, him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. Jesus never encourages vain curiosity, nor does he wish to be regarded as a miracle worker. He sees the crowd coming quickly, and he equally quickly brings the incident to a conclusion and expels the unclean spirit. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead insomuch that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Do we not remember Jairus' daughter? She, she was dead. There's weeping and wailing outside. The professional mourners are there doing their job, and they laugh the Lord to scorn when he says the maid just sleeps. And what does he do? He takes the little maid by the hand and restores her to life. And here again, Jesus takes the child by the hand, lifts him up, and he arose. It would be interesting to do a study. Here's your homework. It would be interesting to do a study to see how often Jesus touches now remember that in, according to the Pharisees, definitely, to touch a leper was not to be done at all. To touch, he touches the, the beer of the funeral of the widow of Nairn's son. He touches this Jairus' daughter who is dead. He touches the leper. Jesus is not afraid of any contamination. Did we not have that at the, um, as one of the preparatory services with the, the altar and how it was made, anything that touched it was made holy. Mr. Greg McDonald was preaching on that. And we see the touch of Jesus curing. We see the touch of Jesus here. He's unafraid to touch to convey his healing to this child, as we have it again in verse 26. And it's only Mark that has these details. He must have listened very carefully to Peter, who was witness to this account, and Peter who told him the story. The shriek caused by the demon is the demon using the boy's vocal cords. Frequently, as I say, we see Peter, we see Jesus lifting people. Peter, who 
looked at the waves and decided and started to sink and Jesus lifts him up. Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus touches him, touches her also. And finally, we come to verses 28 and 29. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Once the disciples were alone with Jesus, they asked him the not unreasonable question, why couldn't we do this? They had previously handed cases of demon possession, but in the present case they failed. Matthew tells us that Jesus answers that it was because of their little faith. Mark seems to imply that either they had not prayed or they had not prayed believing. Where there is little faith, there is oftentimes little praying. I don't imagine you might have much experience of this, but Sometimes, sometimes committees get together, they make the plans, they organise events that's going to happen, and then somebody will say, oh, we need to commend this to the Lord. Shouldn't they have asked for the Lord's guidance and direction before they start making the plans? The disciples should have prayed before they attempted to cure the child, and maybe we wouldn't have had this incident before us this evening. This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. We need to realize where prayer should be in the lives of believers, first and foremost. And what was it Spurgeon said about the prayer meeting? The prayer meeting is the test of the spirituality of a congregation. The prayer meeting, he said, is the greatest thing which the world should fear when believing people are beseeching God to bless his word to the world. And we have prayed twice already, but let us pray again. Let us pray. Again, Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Again, we thank Thee that we have, we have it so freely available to us. And again, we thank Thee for the help of the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us as we seek to read it and to study it and to see marvellous things once again in Thy law. We thank Thee for the complimentary accounts of Matthew, Mark and Luke in this case. We thank thee for the details that the Matthew observed and Peter told Mark of. And look, look, we know, researched greatly, asking various folk with the result of his gospel and later Acts as he wrote it. But we thank thee, gracious one, that these folk were not just writing history books. They were guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. that he brought things to memory and they have preserved these things in writing and thou hast preserved these things down through millennia to us. So here we have it, this wonderful account of the cure of this little boy, this only son of this man. We thank thee, gracious Father, once again for thy word. We thank thee that it teaches us concerning our need, and we thank thee that it shows to us that our need of salvation and forgiveness is to be found in Christ Jesus, and that he has finished the work that thou gave him to do. And we pray, gracious Father, that as we read thy word here in this house of prayer, and as we read it at home also, we should ask beforehand as we read it that thou would show to us the wonders, great wonders, that is to be found in thy word. Forgive us, we pray thee, our many sins. Continue with us through the watches of the night, we ask thee. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord lift up his counsel upon you and give you peace. Amen.